Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tom Miles. I'm the Dean of the University of Chicago Law School. And on behalf of the law school, the Co Sander Institute for Law and Economics, the Becker Friedman Institute for Economics, and the American Financial Exchange, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this discussion about the role of regional, mid sized, and community banks in the economy and in job creation. At the University of Chicago, faculty pursue bold ideas on matters of social consequence and are unafraid to challenge conventional wisdom. As a result, the university has been home to many intellectual breakthroughs, especially in the area of economics and finance, law and regulation. When these breakthroughs occur, ideas are not confined to campus. They have an impact on the world. They influence, even reshape how markets are organized, which markets exist, and how they are regulated. This series of discussion continues that tradition, focusing on the intersection of banking, regulation, and innovation. I look forward to the new ideas that will emerge from it, as well as the new opportunities that will result from them. Opportunities for making our economy stronger and our world better. Again, welcome. I'm honored to introduce today's speakers. I'll start with the Honorable J. Christopher Giancarlo. Mr. Giancarlo is an independent director of the American Financial Exchange, a sponsor of Ameribor and Ameribor Futures. Previously, Mr. Giancarlo served as the 13th chairman of the US Commodity Futures Trading Commission, CFTC. He was first nominated as a CFTC commissioner by President Barack Obama and unanimously confirmed in June 2014. While CFTC chairman, Mr. Giancarlo also served as a member of the U.S. Financial Stability Oversight Committee, the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, the Executive Board of the International Organization of Securities Commissions, and participated in the meetings of the Financial Stability Board. In addition to serving as an independent director of the American Financial Exchange, Mr. Giancarlo serves as the chairman of the board of Common Securitization Solutions, LLC a joint venture between Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and on the advisory board of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Mr. Giancarlo is also a renowned advocate for blockchain technology and a key contributor to the global discourse on cryptocurrencies and digital assets. He is the founding co-editor-in-chief of eSecurities, a trading regulation on the internet by Leader Publications. Mr. Giancarlo is the founder of the Digital Dollar Project, a partnership between Accenture and the Digital Dollar Foundation to advance the exploration of a United States central bank digital currency. This project encourages research and public discussion of the potential advantages of a digital dollar and convenes private sector thought leaders and actors and explores models to support the public sector. Welcome, Mr. Giancarlo. And it's also wonderful to have Brian Brooks here for today's discussion. Mr. Brooks is the acting comptroller of the currency. In this role, he is the administrator of the federal banking system and the chief officer of the office of the comptroller of the currency, the OCC. The OCC supervises nearly 1,200 national banks, federal savings associations, and federal branches and agencies of foreign banks that conduct approximately 70% of all banking business in the United States. The mission of the OCC is to ensure that national banks and federal savings associations operate in a safe and sound manner, provide fair access to financial services, treat customers fairly, and comply with the applicable laws and regulations. The comptroller also serves as a director of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, as a member of the Financial Stability Oversight Council and the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council. Prior to becoming acting comptroller, Mr. Brooks served the OCC as its senior deputy comptroller and chief operating officer. In this role, he oversaw OCC bank supervision, bank supervision policy, supervisory system and analytical support, systemic risk identification support, in specialty supervision and innovation. Previously, Mr. Brooks, Mr. Brooks served as the chief legal officer of Coinbase Global Inc., where he headed the legal compliance, audit, investigations, and government relations functions for the company, which served 20, 20 million customers. Mr. Brooks has also served on the boards of directors of Avant Inc., 
and Fannie Mae, and has also served as an advisor to a number of technology startups. Now, Mr. Brooks' most important accomplishment, however, is that he is a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School, class of 1994. I'm always thrilled to engage, engage with our graduates, and it's especially wonderful to be here today with Mr. Brooks. And finally, I would like to introduce Dr. Richard Sandor, who will moderate our discussion. Dr. Sandor is the CEO of the American Financial Exchange and the Aaron Director Lecturer in Law and Economics at the University of Chicago Law School. Dr. Sandor is a leading financial innovator and entrepreneur, and throughout his distinguished career, he has introduced multiple financial in innovations of tremendous importance. In the 1970s, while he was at the Chicago Board of Trade, Dr. Sandor developed the first interest rate futures contract. One of his creations during that period, the Treasury Bond Futures Contract, is now the most widely traded interest rate future in the world. Dr. Sandor also led the revolution in environmental markets. He developed the first spot and futures markets for sulfur dioxide emissions allowances. He created the first organized market for greenhouse gas emissions reductions and launched the Chicago Climate Exchange in 2003, which was followed by the Chicago Climate Futures Exchange and the European Climate Exchange. In 2015, Dr. Sandor established the American Financial Exchange. It is an electronic marketplace for small and mid-sized banks to borrow and lend short-term funds. AFX launched as an over-the-counter market to trade interbank loans and created an index rate that is set by market forces or an American equivalent to the LIBOR. It is called the Ameribor Index. I'm delighted to introduce today's speakers for this important discussion. And I'll now turn the program over to Dr. Sandor. Thank you all for joining us. Tom, thank you so much for that generous introduction and for the sweeping background of Chris Giancarlo and Brian Brooks. Uh, it's indeed an honor to welcome the 100 plus of our members and, and groups like the Kansas City Fed, FASB, all of whom are in today's audience. Uh, I'm really excited that it has been again sponsored by R.J. O'Brien and Straits, who have been there for every single one. As I told Controller Brooks, he follows in a very rich tradition of efforts between the law school and AFX. Uh, Esther George, Dr. David Bowman, uh, last month, uh, uh, the head of the FDIC, Elena McWilliams. So it's great to have everybody here. I appreciate it. The format will be very, very simple. I will address questions uh, to both the controller and to the Honorable Christian Carlo, um, and they will answer, and the other participant is free to, to chime in. I, I can't imagine a tougher time, uh, <laughs> Brian, to step into a role uh, the, of OCC head. Uh, when you came, the pandemic was just starting and you were invited to sit in that seat uh, at its height in May. Um, and given what has happened to the world, the economy has obviously taken a dramatic hit. Uh, we still have 10 million jobs that, that were short. Uh, while we're getting better at it, we have a long way to go, an unemployment rate that's high. So I'd love to start out by asking you, what's your view of the current state of the economy? How will it impact our members who are large regionals, mid-size and community banks? How are they functioning? in this very tough economic environment from the point of view of the regulator? Well, uh, Richard, thanks for that question. And, uh, and Tom and Chris, thanks so much for spending time and having this conversation. I, I really appreciate it. 
the idea that that is a question I can answer in any meaningful way in three minutes is the craziest idea I've ever heard in my life. But let me let, let me try and frame it this way, at least, and we can get some dialogue going around it. So I begin, my, my whole view of, of this economy and the economic risks we confront and what the way forward is, is predicated on a, a controversial statement. But I'm going to be super provocative right at the outset, okay? And I'm going to say that your statement that the economy took a hit and that 10 million jobs were lost is, is not correct. The economy did not take a hit. We hit the economy. We, we purposely turned it off, okay? So this is different from every other recession that has ever existed. This was not the end of a business cycle. This was not an asset bubble. This was not poor credit underwriting. We decided at a certain time that we confronted a health risk of unknown magnitude. And so we took the switch and we turned it off. I'm cautiously optimistic about the future and about our current, uh, sort of the current state of our banks for the following reason, which is when we turned it off, we had a fairly rapid bipartisan consensus that we could create a set of fiscal stimuli that would be sufficient to carry us from the time we turned the economy off till the time we turned it back on. And at the time we did those things in May, we thought that time period would be somewhere between eight and 12 weeks, right? So we had a certain period of uh, paycheck protection program loans designed to cover people's salaries for a period of time. We had um, uh, you know, federal unemployment supplements of $600 extra a week, thinking that that would be enough to get people through the, through the pandemic. We gave people the option to elect forbearance on their home mortgages so that those loans wouldn't default and we would avoid a foreclosure crisis for a period of time emphasis on for a period of time. What we see now in our banks, Richard, is we still have a little dry powder left. We, we can see in our bank deposit data that there still is a little bit of money left over from those PPP loans and a little bit of excess savings from the unemployment supplement payments and some other things that tell us we've got a little bit of runway left and we can probably make it without another stimulus another month or two, but not six. And so the question becomes, all right, for banks that right now are not having enormous loan losses, they're taking reserves, but their loan losses are not high, they'll be fine if in two months we've turned the economy back on. But if we were still mandating all of the precautionary measures that are being mandated in places like New York and California today, then without a stimulus package, we're gonna have real problems. And so the message I keep carrying forward is this recession is different from every other recession. The banks entered the recession very well capitalized, and thus far, the federal payments have been terrific. They will run out, whether it's now or at the end of the next package, and at some point, we've got to get back to normal. So I'll leave it there. There's a lot of other things we could say about that, but I would just say this is a different kettle of fish entirely, and we need to get to the other end of it. You uh, in a really a prescient form when you took office, you know, alerted regulators and others that financial health was a cousin to physical health. And you put up a clarion call for our regulators to understand that these were dual risks, financial and health, and they had to be married together. Um, have we achieve the right balance, Brian, in managing the need to restore the, the economy, as you said, from having turned it, and managing uh, health risk associated with COVID-19. Yeah, you know, that's one of those questions where to ask it is, is I think, to answer it. Uh, you know, so so I think we have not done a great job of balancing risks and benefits here. I, I think we've taken an amazingly monocultural um, approach to this, like this is a univariate equation, and nothing in life is a univariate equation. So so what I would just say is that um, you know one thing I learned at the University of Chicago is economics is not the science of money. Economics is the science of choices. Right? People are constantly making choices in their lives. And I don't think that we've had a great dialogue in this country about whether we would prefer to have widespread lockdowns with the associated mental health impacts, domestic abuse impacts, divorce and suicide rates and everything else in exchange for slightly reducing the number of coronavirus non-fatal cases, or if we would make a slightly different calibration. But somebody needs to do that. And the problem in this country is, <clears throat> other than Congress and the president, there's no one entity that is empowered to do that, right? I only have control of the financial architecture. 
somebody else has control of the healthcare system and the like. So my short answer after that long-winded answer is we haven't and we need to do so quickly. Thank you. Um, that's a good segue into the, the next question. Um, uh, I've been around for 700 years. <laughs> Brian. And every decade, we're told a one in a hundred year event occurs. So in 73, it was the oil embargo. In 79, it was Volcker letting rates hit 20%. In 87, it was the stock market crash. In 97, it was a meltdown of the Asian economies. In 2001, it was 9-11. In 2007, 8, it was the Great Recession. And now it's COVID-19. Chris, are there other risks out there, unintended, <laughs> that could happen? What do regulators and others have to be concerned about the economic risks that we don't see. What, what is out there? First, Chris, and then Brian, if you would. Uh, where is, where's the next black swan, even though the very nature of the question is odd in itself? And almost the nature of the question defines the answer, and that is that these unanticipated events are just that. They are unanticipated. Who would have ever predicted going into this year what this year has is, is come to be, uh, not in a million years? And yet, what's remarkable is how uh, relatively um, um, unremarkable has been some of the, uh, the, the, the fallout. You know, as someone who's been in the markets for years, you always know that when there's some sort of economic shock, a lot of trades that were going in the wrong direction suddenly result in the failure of financial firms. And yet, and certainly on the retail side, we saw that. But in the financial services area, we didn't see some of the fallout that perhaps I would have anticipated as a market regulator. Now, that may be because of the PPE and of other things, but I also think it has to do with some of the preparations uh, that have gone on. Um, in, in, uh, at coming out of the last financial crisis. I see, think some of those have worked quite well. But I, what I would say is we very well, mel, very well may see uh, implications that take time to reveal themselves. And going back to the opening point about health, some of the health aspects of the COVID-19 choices, to use Brian Brooks's phrase, the choices, we're, we're going to see down the road, the, the health screenings, the cancer screenings that didn't take place, the mental health conditions that, that have gone unaddressed. Some of the health um, impacts of the choices we made, we felt elsewhere or at another time. And I think the same may be true about some of the financial implications. I think the PPE and some of the other uh, short-term uh, um, alleviation of the problem may actually be masking longer-term impacts that we'll see further down the road. Brian? Yeah, I, I would throw out a few things. First of all, I, I think Chris is always eloquently uh, uh, delivers wisdom that we all would do well to listen to. Uh, you know, there are not enough voices like that on these kinds of issues. If I were going to add anything to that, I agree with everything you said. So I'll try and say one or two things that are different. I think that um, uh, there will be significant geopolitical dislocation from China in ways that we haven't seen yet. And I think uh, I know we're going to talk about this uh, a little later. But I think one of those has to do with our complacency as the country that gives the world its reserve currency. Uh, you know, many people do not appreciate how much of our standard of living, right, that we're all around right now is the result of the fact that because the dollar is the global reserve currency, we basically get a 10% discount on everything we buy in the world, right? When we go to Saudi Arabia to buy oil, we buy it in dollars. They have to change money into dollars and exchange, engage in foreign exchange and all kinds of other costly things. That is not going to persist. Uh, and it's not going to persist in this generation. So this is one of the reasons I think why Chris and I are both so passionate about the idea of accelerating the velocity of dollars by adding features. That's what digitization of the dollar is all about, is not just to take for granted that everyone must use it, but to make it an asset of choice that transacts better and is more liquid and faster uh, than other currencies are. Uh, you know, And if we don't do that, what China will do, uh, because there are just so darn many more of them than there are of us, is as they modernize and grow, they will render us economically kind of a second fiddle player. That's going to be a problem. 
they will do that because already today they control a majority of the computing power on the Bitcoin blockchain. They've already issued a central bank digital currency in the form of the e b which was rolled out just a week ago. And we are still talking about accelerating that stuff over the next four years or so. So I think the next bolt from the blue is likely to come from foreign competition in some respect. That's a great insight. Brian, you, we've talked about and you mentioned unbundling. Uh, since you've been there, there have been new bank charters like Vero, uh, Gico. Um, are we evolving into special purpose banks that will flower digital banks? And what does that mean for concentration in banking? Are we going to have more banks, less banks? Or does that even matter? Is it only a matter of, of servicing the financial sector's needs with the appropriate banking resources? Yeah, that, that, that last thing you said, I, I wish I could model that because I haven't said it that way and I should start saying that way. So uh, <laughs> Brian Hubbard, who's on the phone, write that down. I need to get that line. Here, here's what I think. I don't think that there's any magic to, to the word bank. So when people say, oh my God, we've got these new mono lines coming online, are they threatening banking? Listen, if I'm a consumer, what I care about is not banking. Banking is an intermediary service. What I care about is I want to be able to buy a house. How am I going to do that? I don't have enough money on hand to do that. So somebody's got to make me a loan. Or I need to send a payment to somebody in a foreign country. How am I going to do that? Right? I don't live in that country and I don't have a bank account there. How will I do that? And so historically, banks were that that was the word that we gave to the intermediaries that would engage in those transactions for us. My point about unbundling is that for a bunch of reasons, some of them having to do with consumer preferences and some of them having to do with investor sort of demand, is that the depository institutions of the world have not been the service provider of choice for some of those services for a pretty long time now. And that's why we now have multi-billion dollar companies that are payment specialists or marketplace lenders that don't take deposits. And I think at least for the moment, that seems to be what investors wanna see, and it seems to be how consumers wanna receive their services. So that would be my short answer. Now, uh, Tom Miles, Chris Giancarlo, I see that Richard has has vanished from our screen, so I could continue filibustering, or you know, we could have a dialogue as he rejoins, and, and there he is. Now, Richard, you have to guess what my answer was. I think I heard enough of it uh, to, get into the the flow of it and i and i was glad to hear that we are thinking about the problem in the same sort of way it's it's really are you delivering optimum services uh, do yep. financial intermediaries serve the real economy and do they do it well chris you know, um What's your thoughts on this or where do you come out? And, um, and I suspect that we're probably all in a similar category, but go ahead, Chris. Well, uh, uh, Controller Brooks is absolutely sure. right that we can't use, uh, we can't rely on form over function. We need to look at the function of services to determine uh, how to categorize them. And at no, at no point in time is this more important than I think where we are right now, where we're going through this new wave of the internet, what some people call the internet of value, when things of value are going to be tokenized, digitized, and, and able to be transacted on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. And we need to take a really broad look at, at the notion of financial services, the, the notion of what the role that uh, the value provision is going to be in this new uh, digital direct model of the internet is going to change dramatically. And I think if we have two, if as regulators have too wooden an approach to this market, uh, we're going to miss that innovation. You know, regulators have an enormously important role to play in not stopping innovation. It, 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 regulation can hold innovation back for a generation or more. If it's, if it's too wooden and too stuck in the past, regulators almost have a duty to be forward leaning and to be anticipating uh, the technology changes that are coming and to take a, a principles based approach to, to regulation if they're not going to hold back the whole economic growth that comes with new innovation. I think that's a real risk right now in the developed economies as we look at, at the East where they're building new financial systems on a fresh with a fresh sheet of paper based upon new digital technologies. Meanwhile, we've got technologies and regulatory systems that were laid out 100 years ago 
in many cases. It served well for a long time, but are really going to be challenged by this new wave of exponential digital technology and this new evolution of the Internet. We're going to get on to more of this later. And, and just to tell all of the members and guests who were there, and I've been going back and forth to Washington for five decades, and, and it's not the usual case that regulators, Controller Brooks or the Honorable Chris Giancarlo, are way ahead of technology. My experience has been often the regulators are behind the technology, not in favor of it. So you in the audience are listening to very unique viewpoints by very unique people who are thinking about the world in 2030. And that is not normally the case. In as a segue um, to the, the controller's remarks and your both questions about the role and function, we now have seen you particularly, Controller Brooks, talk about a program called REACH. And, and I think that's a great segue about what, in fact, regulators and banks are doing now to serve the real economy. And so tell us a little bit about that and, and the program and what you see the OCC is doing regarding distributions of wealth, minorities, uh, the, the whole current issue that occupies the front page of our leading newspapers. Well, um, I, I, I can't emphasize what I'm about to say strongly enough, but since this is a Chicago event, let me just begin by saying, Richard, that you and I both studied under Ronald Coase, you in his prime, me late in his life, but we both sat and listened to him and Posner and Easterbrook and Epstein and, you know, going back a ways, George Stigler and the great, you know, owners of the market economy. The Chicago School is the intellectual home of market economics. And I am personally very worried. I am not kidding about this. I'm not being political about this. I am very worried that the social consensus that markets are a good thing is under real threat. And I think it might be at a real threat for real reasons, which I'll come to in a second. But my point is the reason that at the OCC we launched this project is precisely because I have protest marches going down outside of my house nearly every night calling for major change of the system and the structures that some people believe have produced you know, racially unequal outcomes and other kinds of things. So if we don't do something quickly to show very visibly that in fact markets are great though some of the structures we've used to enact markets have not been as great. And if we don't fix those things, the foundations of what we all went to the University of Chicago to learn are going to be in real peril. And I think that would be a disaster. So what Project Reach is about is identifying these structural inadequacies that aren't there for overtly racist reasons, but nonetheless do affect people differently depending on their social background and fix those things. So let me just give you a couple of examples. One has to do with the concept of the credit score. So in my world, I grew up in consumer lending, and consumer lending is all about predicting who's going to repay a loan and who's not going to repay a loan, right? And for this, we have various measures, including credit scores. Credit scores are fairly good, not great, fairly good predictors of whether a person is going to repay a loan over time. They tend to capture about 60% of credit worthiness, which means that many of the people we're making loans to are unknowingly to us not going to repay that loan. But they also mean that many of the people we're denying credit to would have repaid the loan if we had extended it. And the problem we really have is, as clunky as that tool is, wait for this news, 45 million Americans don't have a credit score and thus can't be considered for credit at all. And that 45 million population, it does not look like America. It is way more heavily skewed toward Blacks and Hispanics than their overall representation in the broader society. So disproportionately, these credit scores are keeping out Blacks and Hispanics relative to other classes. It turns out there are ways we could capture the credit worthiness of those people. We could measure their rent payments, their utility payments, their Netflix subscriptions, 
and other recurring bills that they pay on time every month but get no credit for. And then we could visibly bring people into the economy that financial services serves so well for the rest of us. We need to do stuff like that. Another example would be the 20% down payment requirement to buy a house. Periodically, there are experiments with low down payment programs. Those tend not to persist very long because there's a downturn. Those loans fail at elevated rates and we get rid of them until the next cycle. But Richard, in the same way that you sort of invented the concept of the derivative back in the 70s, I am trying to invent a new concept of housing finance based on the idea that we don't need only debt financing, but that equity financing could be a way of doing this. So imagine a world where you take out a 5% down payment, and then instead, instead of having a first mortgage and a second mortgage on top of that to cover the cost, imagine if you had a 5% down payment, an 80% loan, and a 15% equity strip that some co-venturer would help invest in for which no payments were due until you sold the house and the person was taking principal risk in the underlying real estate. That loan, our models are sort of indicating preliminarily, would perform just about as well as a 20% down payment loan. And far more people could get into houses because you wouldn't have had to inherit money from your parents to fund the 20% down payment. These kinds of things can bring Blacks and Hispanics and immigrants and other underserved communities into the financial services system and let them build wealth the same way we all did. When we do that, we're not just gonna solve this moment of social justice protests, we're gonna save market economics, which this group ought to care about a lot. And I, I think you make a fantastic point and we both agree and our mentors would agree that because there is a market failure, it doesn't necessarily mean that markets fail. It could be that institutions fail. And by relooking at things like credit scores, you can provide a better stadium where the rules and regs permit a, and allow and facilitate equitable outcomes. And, and I think congratulations, this is a great effort that affects people who need to have credit and it recognizes that there's been an institutional failure. And this I think is, is a critical point. Just as a follow on to that, how about things like the community or CRA credits? And as long as we're talking about minority, we've made a big effort at AFX to get endorsements for Ameribor by minority depository institutions. Tell me a little bit about the CRA credits and any other things, because I think you're really taking us into very promising areas of institutional change. Well, I, I appreciate that, Richard. And as anybody who watches the OCC knows, the Community Reinvestment Act rule is probably the most important thing that's happened at the OCC in the last couple of years at a minimum. You know, for, for those who are not hardcore banking people, you need to know that what the Community Reinvestment Act represents, I mean, yes, it is an important civil rights law, but it's also common sense in the following sense, which is, we allow banks to take artificially cheap government subsidized deposits as a way of funding themselves. So if you or I wanted to go start a business, we'd have to go out into the capital markets. We'd have to pay a market rate of return to attract investment into our businesses. Banks don't have to do that. People will lend you money if you're a bank at almost 0%. They're happy to just have a safe place to store it, right? And the reason that rates are artificially low in banks is because there's FDIC insurance. So the bargain with the Community Reinvestment Act is, will let you take these artificially cheap government subsidized deposits in exchange for an agreement that you will take some of those deposits and reinvest the proceeds back in the communities where you gathered them in the first place. That was the thought. Here's the problem. Technology has undermined the basic assumption of the CRA. So the way the CRA was written was at a time when banks gathered deposits in physical branches that you'd walk into off the street. Nobody does that anymore. I'm the bank regulator, and it's probably been 18 months since I last walked into a bank branch. Nobody does that anymore. And yet the way the rule has worked is that we only measure your lending and investment in the geographic areas around your, around your branches. That's, that's the problem. And so what we've tried to do in CRA modernization is to say, hey, we're going to redefine your zone of, of interest away from your physical branches and into any area where you gather the majority of your deposits. That's, that's sort of the concept. 
But the underlying thing, uh, which Richard, you point out, is we've also tried to re reimagine what are the activities that should get credit for CRA. So historically, it was pretty opaque which things would get credit. But we've tried to be super clear that things like, you know, funding rural broadband in a distressed agricultural community, that's going to qualify. You know, building housing and other uh, sort of infrastructure in a neighborhood that has been underinvested in or doing a project that will throw off investment in affordable housing in that neighborhood, that will qualify as well. We've just tried to bring more economic reality into a world where the old rules of banking don't really apply. End of the day, you cannot take yourself up a rung on the ladder if there's not risk capital out there. And that's where banks and CRA really come together. This is turning out to be a great chat about change and embracing it. And, and you make a very important, the German philosopher Schopenhauer, you know, said the truth goes through, I'm paraphrasing, three different states. It's the first, the idea is dismissed as insane. After that, it's violently opposed and then subsequently viewed as self-evident. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, your notion of change and broadening the definition of, from a branches thing. And, and this is a good segue. Chris, you've been involved in cryptocurrencies and the digital dollar and all of these things that look like they either are insane or opposed. Give us a few minutes on cryptos and the digital dollar, just so our members get an idea of what you're thinking about in this Schopenhauer scenario of, of insanity to opposition to self-evidency. Well, you know, Richard, it's funny you say that because we went through those exact three stages when we at the CFTC um, allowed Bitcoin futures to go forward. And uh, we were first told we were insane, then we were violently opposed. And now it's just become part of the of the fundamental landscape with every institutional investor now uh, having cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, as part of their portfolio. And if anything else, it actually took some of the volatility out of the marketplace and has made it an asset class alongside uh, a lot of asset classes that we all know very, very well. And I think we're probably somewhere between maybe we're in that second, maybe going into that third stage right now with the notion of development of a U.S. central bank digital currency. Uh, I, I must say that others uh, around the world probably have taken the heat because others are way ahead of the United States in, in experimentation with a central bank digital currency. And the United States has been slow to recognize the importance of this. Uh, but I think that is starting to accelerate. And certainly uh, my, my communications, both at the official and unofficial levels, are that the United States is really waking to the issue. And I think some of uh, Comptroller Brooks' comments earlier about the threat to the United States, if it doesn't get into this technological um, a new field uh, is 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 quite rem is it potentially quite um, impactful on our on our U.S. economy. So um, I've been following this for some time. It, it 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 comes from my observation that so much of our financial market infrastructure uh, that was built in the last century was fit for purpose fifty to sixty years ago is increasingly becoming obsolete. You know, no different than our bridges and tunnels and airports. A lot of our financial market infrastructure is similarly creaky and out of date and in need of, of a wholesale replacement. And at the same time that's happening, we're going through this new wave of the Internet that's really going to transform the, 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 the nature of things of value and how they're uh, transacted from person to person. And so uh, earlier this year, I formed the Digital Dollar Foundation, and that teamed up with Accenture to create the Digital Dollar Project to really create a think tank to, to really – broaden the discussion and to, to uh, make the official sector and the private sector here in the United States aware of efforts going on around the world and why this is important uh, for the United States um, for all the reasons that, that, uh, that Controller Brooks said. You know, I'll give you a simple example. At the CFTC, we ov oversee many markets for things of value, whether it be agricultural commodities, precious metals, energy products, uh, foreign exchange, uh, other valuable commodities. Today, most of them are priced in dollars. And that gives us an enormous advantage, as Controller Brooks pointed out. Well, as those things themselves go into a digital programmable 
uh, format. You, we're now seeing massive amounts of soybean shipments around the world done on a blockchain basis. As, as those go into a digital tokenized format, how long can the dollar remain the, wor- the thing that they're priced in if the dollar it remains an analog instrument, not programmable, not linkable to those things of value in, a contr- in, in an automated algorithmic sense? I, I know that may sound a little pie in the sky, but it's coming. And that's one of the big drivers for China's experimentation with the digital RMB, or as, as C- Controller Brooks points out, it's no longer experimentation. They've gone live. They're working on this. They've got tens of thousands of companies and, 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 and hundreds of thousands of people working on this. Um, and it is rolling real fast. Meanwhile, we've got a few dozen um, uh, working on this on the official side. And I'll leave, leave you one last thing. The explosion of stable coins, the explosion of, of cryptocurrencies is in some ways a, ref, a, a workaround for the lack of a digital, a digital currency, the, the lack of tokenization and programmability about our currency is driving technological innovation, but innovation that works around that analog nature. And that's one of the reasons why I personally believe we've got to also experiment with the digital dollar uh, that can that can interact with these other uh, innovations in, 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 a, in, a, in a new uh, wave of, uh, re- I think, really exciting uh, development of the Internet of Things of Value. I think you're both in agreement, and I, uh, Controller Brooks, Brian, do you think that there are other major obstacles to modernizing the financial structure of the country? Clearly, technology is f- at the forefront, but anything else you'd like to add is your biggest fear about what might not be modernized? Yeah, well, <clears throat> look, I, I would, I'll give you one um, regulatory answer and one behavioral economics answer. So I think the, the regulatory answer is we have a really unusual uh, structure in this country, which is partly a strength, partly it's a weakness. And, and that is, A, even at the federal level, we have a highly distributed uh, set of authorities over our banking system. And that's if you assume only the banks and don't talk about the broader financial system of which... Chris was a leader and the SEC chair is a leader and everything else. So we have three banking agencies in this country, each of which have direct uh, authority over various parts of the system, but they're all separate. So, you know, I am in charge of the banking system, but the Fed is in charge of the payment system, but only banks can connect to the payment system. Yet we have two different people with two very different policy viewpoints sort of working on that. So that's an issue. And then, of course, there's the federal versus state overlay as well. So weirdly, this is an ironic comment, the difficulty in us achieving decentralization through blockchains is precisely because of the decentralization of our regulatory authorities in this country where there's nobody who can make a decision, ironically enough. Here's the behavioral economics question though uh, also, and it's funny because I've been thinking a lot about back in the day when I took Cass Sunstein's seminar at uh, the law school and we were reading you know, papers by Kahneman and Tversky at a time when nobody had heard of those guys. And now just this week, I'm, re-re- I'm re-reading the Michael Lewis book about those guys. So I have this on the brain. And that is, there is this concept of status quo bias, right? So there's the idea that the status quo is the risk-free option and any deviation from the status quo is the risky option. And this is a natural way the human brain works, but you know, we look at the devil we know and we think, well, we, we've got this. We've figured out how to do workarounds, as Chris said, and we're all sort of uh, thinking that we know how to navigate this system, but, but blockchain, right? I see this in crypto all the time. I, mean, I worked in crypto for two years. Now I'm regulating some of it. The issue always is we have to be very, very careful of crypto because there could be money laundering. Well, um, here's a news flash. There's an enormous amount of money laundering in the world, 98% of it happening through the banking system. That's not to downplay the money laundering risks of crypto, but it is definitely to say we need to focus on the idea that this is an endemic part of our economy that must be managed. If we didn't want there to be any kind of risk like that in the system, we would never have allowed the internet to exist because in the early days, the only thing the internet was good for was pornography and bank scams, right? We still have all the pornography and bank scams we ever had on the internet, but now we also have Amazon. We need to allow the internet of money to evolve in like fashion, but because of status quo bias, I worry we won't. Uh, now, one, if I could just jump in with one thing there, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, 
Controller Brooks and I have something in common, and we have a number of things in common, but we both have uh, long careers in, in the private sector and probably will end our careers in the private sector. And we've enjoyed and, and been honored to be able to serve in the public sector for a period of time. There are proposals to make uh, private sector access into the public sector very, very hard and, and restrictive. And, and the problem with that is, and with great respect to my colleagues that have spent a lifetime uh, in government, that that status quo bias can come really strong when uh, the, the best way to end a political career is go to a congressional hearing and, and, and have a question, how could you ever allow that new innovation to go forward, you know, end a political career? I, I think there's a, a, one of the benefits of the U.S. system is this, um, uh, this, this coming and going of, of people that have uh, uh, done things in the private sector can bring that skill set to bear in the public sector. And if you look at systems like Europe, I have a lot of respect for the, the, the uh, civil service there in Europe, but you don't see risk taking at the official level because you have people that have spent a lifetime in politics. And so I'd hate to see a, a change in the U.S. where we don't have the benefit of the of private sector people going into government, uh, being able to serve their country, do well, but also bring some some outside the box thinking and perhaps even a little bit of of, of maybe uh, a comfort level with calculated risk uh, that doesn't exist often with uh, political appointees. And, and so um, I hope that's not something that we're going to see in some sort of future where government service becomes only for an appointed class of, of government bureaucrats and the private sector is, is somehow private sector business experience is considered suspect and, and not appropriate for government service. Well, I, I think uh, I would just chime in with what you said, Chris, and, and with what Controller Brooks said. And I would add to that something we fear what uh, academic economists call rent seekers. And the status quo really favors the existing rent seekers, those people that have franchises granted by the government, but a free market would take away. And if we break the mold, we break the rent seekers monopoly. Um, and that's an important factor to have and, and important for our banking system and the markets in general. I can't help but following in on this uh, change by uh, putting out a fat one to, to both of you. We are now witnessing what will be the greatest uh, financial change in history, $500 trillion of a benchmark that is going away. So um, what does the world look like? Will it go away, Controller Brooks? Uh, will it be smooth? How will it affect the banking system? This is $500 trillion. No change of this magnitude has occurred in modern financial history, save the invention of the limited liability of the Dutch East India Company. So where do we, where do we go from here, Controller Brooks? Where do we go uh, here, Chris? Uh, what do you think about the LIBOR transition and will it happen and will it be smooth? Oh man! <clears throat> well, uh, first of all, Richard, this this conversation just reminds me of how much I miss Chicago. This is the best conversation I've had in a long time. There's only there's one of your questions I can answer with confidence. Will it be smooth? No. Uh, your other questions are all open to interpretation. But when I say no, the, the reason it won't be smooth is you have a whole lot of legacy assets, and then you have new credits being originated. The transition from the legacy assets will not be smooth for a simple reason, which is not all of the $500 trillion you're talking about, but a significant minority of them are in paper that did not anticipate a different reference rate. And so there's no contractual entitlement to change the reference rate. So when LIBOR goes away, or if it goes away, because as you know, there's a possibility that some rump version of something called LIBOR will continue into the future. Everybody who issued that paper is gonna get sued either by their borrowers or by their investors. And so my belief, and I think the belief of others in the government is that we're going to need to think in the new year about some kind of a government indemnity for issuers of that paper uh, when we when we do this transition. That's going to be a rocky road. Going forward, however, you, 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 know, mean, I, you mean by that things like preferred stocks that are out preferred, there? 
Yeah, absolutely. But but I'll tell you something. There, there's a number of um, mortgage-backed security instruments, uh, um, you know, adjustable rate loans that originated prior to a certain point that never anticipated that LIBOR would go away. And so all the contract says is it's LIBOR plus 250, and there's no reference to, and if LIBOR becomes unavailable, then X. What does one do in that circumstance, right? There, there will be litigation, I, I think, certainly, and it will be significant. So we're going to need some sort of a backstop. Chris, what um, comes after the litigation? Well, I'll tell you what, it, what's, what's remarkable to me is just how long LIBOR has held on. I mean, it, it, you know, it's, it's this enormous edifice built upon a, a, a barely a, a, a foundation of, of one stone. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a shallow marketplace. I think in the 30-day LIBOR, there's less than a dozen trades a day and, and, and maybe a little bit more in some of the other tenors. Uh, on, on upon which is built a, a multi-trillion dollar uh, a consumer finance market. It's also a relatively narrow market in that you've got about six banks um, uh, basically doing a call around or an estimate around marketplace. So it's it's both it's both shallow and narrow, uh, and yet it supports this enormous edifice. And then the other thing that's odd about it is is the ubiquity of it. I mean, um, uh, in, in in most asset classes, and I certainly know this well, the CFTC. In most assets classes, you have a, a plethora of benchmarks. You know, in, in energy, you've got the WTI, you've got the Brent crude, you've got the Shanghai, you've got the Dubai index. In equities, you've got dozens, if, if not perhaps hundreds of, of equity indexes. In, 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 uh, in wheat, you've got six different uh, wheat indexes. And, and yet, in, somehow, in, in, in commercial lending, we're so dependent on this one benchmark built upon such a narrow and shallow foundation. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's amazing it's hold, held on this long. And, and whatever we come up with as to help the transition along, it seems to me, at least, that the transition is inevitable. And I think it's inevitable to multiple benchmarks. I just don't see anything like LIBOR ever happening again. And the history of how it came about is itself a series of unintended consequences uh, and a long story, but I don't think it's something we're, the likes of which we're, we're likely to see again in the future. Chris, uh, thank you uh, very much. You know, this is, as the controller Brooks said, and you said, this is the University of Chicago. We believe in a free market for ideas. I'll shamelessly say we're working on one together. It's called the Maribor. There's SOFR, there's the Bank Yield Index that hopefully is uh, a thousand flowers will bloom and, and the market will sort out what is optimal. Under uh, the controller's theory of deltas, we started five minutes late, and but we will end five minutes late. So we have about... 10 to 12 minutes uh, for the audience to ask questions. This has been thrilling. It's really a lot of fun talking to both of you. And I hope we can keep you here for 12 minutes to see if we have any questions. But it's been a wonderful conversation and very engaging. Eris, can I uh, ask you to uh, please produce this segment of questions for us? Oh, yes, of course. We do have one question from Scott Simmons, and he is asking if uh, banks pay for FDIC insurance rather than being government uh, subsidized. Well, um, the answer is yes and no. So, so banks don't remotely pay the full cost of the risk they present to the system. And they certainly don't capture all of the externalities caused by the fact of the existence of FDIC insurance changing people's behavior. So they pay an amount of money, that, that is definitely true. But is the, if that's thought of as the full actuarial risk to the deposit insurance fund, I would say the answer is definitely not. Sort of like how Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac pre-financial crisis had capital but it turned out to be not remotely enough capital to bear the losses that were incurred in 2008. So I think that's probably the closest analogy. Chris, any uh, reaction? No, I think um, I, I certainly agree with uh, Controller Brooks's view on that. Good, I, I think, uh, Eris, you wanna move on? Yes, all right, so we have one more question from Augustin Ortado. 
And this question is from Mr. Brooks. What do you think is more efficient, CRA or subsidies to minority depository institutions and, F, excuse me, and CDFIs? There is some evidence that CRA induces risky lending. Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. And I think there is evidence uh, to that effect to some extent. So let me, let me start first with the CRA versus minority deposit institutions trade off. So the volume of CRA activity every year is somewhere on the order of like $450 billion. The amount of total assets in minority deposit institutions in the United States is something like maybe 5% of that. So I don't think these are substitutes for each other. It's not as though we can trade one off against the other. Now, whether CRA is effective, that's another question, but just the sheer magnitude is, is wildly different. But I will say this about minority deposit institutions. They play a unique role uh, in, in the system in the sense that they are trust providers to certain segments of the minority community that large you know, mega banks likely never will be, at least not in, not in the current generation. My evidence for this is that when I was at Fannie Mae, one of the most intriguing pieces of uh, data I ever saw was the number of people still paying 7% interest on their mortgages when market rates were at 3%. And you know, markets would tell you that if, if uh, money is a commodity and there are no transaction costs, there should not be anyone paying 7% when 3% credit is widely available. And yet there was. Why was that? The reason was the 7% mortgage population heavily skewed minority, particularly black. And they would receive, that community would receive refinance solicitations in the mail, and they would assume that there was a good chance they were being scammed, and so they wouldn't take up the refinance opportunity. And they assumed it for a reason, which is as a cohort, they have been scammed more often than, than non-minorities have been. And minority deposit institutions can solve that, right? They can create the cultural affinity and the sense of safety that brings people into a system that they otherwise would prefer to avoid. So I think that's an important thing. Um, and, and then uh, at, the, at the end of the day, what was the last part of the question about FDIC insurance? I don't know, maybe, maybe I'll just leave it there because I'm filibustering, but hopefully those are two responsive points. Yeah, I, I, go ahead, Richard. No, go ahead, Chris, please. I, I was gonna simply say that the, that the, 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 uh, the analysis shows that MDIs are very effective uh, at serving the needs of their communities, uh, uh, whether it be in lending, whether it be in, in other forms of serving as an on-ramp into the financial uh, service sector. And, and it's very important that we take their unique needs into account as we as, we as regulators and others. That's one of the things that I, I find uh, very satisfying in my work with AFX. It's been endorsed by the National Bankers Association, which is the leading minority owned uh, uh, bank uh, trade association, and they recognize in Ameribor uh, an ability for smaller institutions to engage in horizontal lending with other smaller institutions and medium-sized and regional uh, bank institutions to satisfy their funding needs uh, without being wholly dependent on the large Wall Street banks. And so uh, in, in terms of giving, making sure that the, the official sector supports uh, MDIs, I think that uh, we at Ameribor feel we've got something to offer. Right. And uh, Controller Brooks, I think, really hit it on the head, because if we take a look at, at, at the COSIAN filters, it's all about transaction costs. And we have uh, banks like Citizens and Unity, you know, who made loans of $400 under the PPP program, that just would not be possible given costs for a large institution to do. They couldn't do the credit or unity in Texas. And you know, these banks lend thousands of dollars and the transaction costs for a money center bank would, is, makes it not feasible. So I think your statement, Controller Brooks, about being close to it is really can be looked at through the filter of transactions costs and efficiently doing credit analysis at the local level where the problem is. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. I would also just add that, you know, uh, another sort of partial disciple of Coase, uh, Posner uh, back in his day used to talk about the idea of mental externalities as being an externality that economists often miss. 
right? So things like fear and it's all really all of the things that behavioral economics have taught us are not actually non-economic. They're just not things that are readily captured in economic models. But the fact that someone is afraid based on experience that they might be scammed, that's a transaction cost. I, I think uh, that's a great way to wrap it up. We've, we have uh, normally at this point, we have people leaving because we're past the witching hour. There's 70 odd people still left. And uh, I think that's good. You- If I may look, Tristan, we have one have, more question. There's one- Okay, <laughs> I'll yield to it. Go ahead, Eris. This question is for uh, Controller Brooks. Uh, this is from Joel Jastrom, and he would like to hear the balance of Mr. Brooks' comment about LIBOR perhaps going away. Yeah, well, so, so thanks for that question. Uh, the point I was trying to make is there's a retrospective part of the LIBOR termination, and there's the prospective part of a world without LIBOR. Retrospectively, I think I've already made the point that there's a lot of assets that can't readily be changed under the language of the contract, and so it's going to be a fight about what right a lender has to select a replacement rate. Going forward, there's been a weird amount of call for the US government to specify a replacement reference rate for new assets, as opposed to specifying a reference rate for the legacy assets on which payments are still due into the future. My personal view is, you know, loan agreements are private contracts. Um, a, a given institution's competitiveness depends in part on its cost of funds, its return on investment expectations of its investors and a series of other things. And so why we think there needs to be a single replacement rate, like why, why would SOFR, for instance, be the replacement rate for all newly originated assets of any type when SOFR might be well-structured for short-term derivatives contracts and very poorly suited for long duration assets like mortgages. Um, our basic view is, listen, banks ought to be allowed to select their own appropriate reference rate, which might even change by product that they're issuing. Ameribor obviously is an interesting example of something that's better than LIBOR in the sense that it's based on actual transactions versus a telephone quotation service that's subject to fraud and manipulation. Um, but you know, like all reference rates, it may be stronger for certain assets of certain duration and credit types and less good for other assets of other types. So my only point is going forward, I think markets are probably a better answer than the government dictating a particular rate and then us having to frame everything around that rate. No better way to end than on, the, on those words, endorsing markets and endor endorsing choice. Um, Controller Brooks, it's been fabulous being with you. Chairman Giancarlo, fabulous. You both have done a great job. I, I think uh, all of the faculty, students, uh, hopefully will look at this uh, fireside chat and learn something. Thank you all very much. Be well, stay safe, and have a good day. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.